Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Aros, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. Welcome to today's event, which is uh, being brought to you by our League's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Today's program is entitled Gentrification. What is it and who is at the table? We'll be discussing just what happens if new development comes to your neighborhood and who gets to make the decisions about that. I promise that what you hear from our four panelists today will be very enlightening and possibly a little concerning. So let's get started. I would like to introduce you to today's moderator, Greater Tucson League member and former Arizona State Legislator, Ms. Hershella Horton. Take it away, Hershella. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Aras. Good morning and welcome to an educational, interesting and informative program on gentrification. As Kathy told you, this meeting has, this program has been initiated and planned by DEI, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. We want to help inform Tucson area residents about what happens when development comes to neighborhoods. Tucson has different ethnic groups and income levels. When development decisions are made, these groups are affected. The League has done educational forums for 100 years, broadening their commitment to inform all, not just women. This morning, we'll be learning about gentrification, displacement, decisions, and who needs to be at the table when these development decisions are made. Each of the four panelists has up to 15 minutes for their presentation and will be timed by Tracy Peterson. Ms. Peterson, please wave so people can see you and know where to look for their timing. We want to be sure that all panelists have equal time to present and that we have time for the Q&A. The Q&A will begin after all four panelists have presented. You can submit and I urge you to submit your questions throughout the program. Type them into the Q&A. That's at the bottom of the toolbar. It says Q&A at the toolbar, toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And a dialogue box will open and you can type and submit your questions. Debbie Wallace will get the questions to me. We are beginning with Dr. Gary Paivo. Dr. Paivo is professor of real estate development and urban planning at the University of Arizona. And he teaches in the areas of sustainable cities, land development process and urban form. He will present the definition pros and cons, studies on gentrification and displacement, and strategies, sort of a shared development, all within 15 minutes. Dr. Paivo. Well, good morning, everybody. My compliments to the League for uh, bringing us all together for this event. Um, I'm going to make a presentation um, uh, on the subject of, uh, of uh, gentrification. In particular, what is it why does it happen and what are we gonna do about it? Um, and so um, I wanna begin with uh, this definition, which is uh, dates back to 64. It's really the first definition that was offered and they were working on London at the time. One by one, many of the working class quarters have been invaded by the middle class, upper and lower. Once this process of gentrification starts, it goes on rapidly until all or most of the working class occupiers are displaced and the whole social character of the district is changed. It's about moving in, it's about displacement. More contemporary definitions um, are a little bit different. Uh, in 98, this one, the first one, the process by which central urban neighborhoods have undergone disinvestment that have undergone disinvestment and economic decline, experience a reversal, reinvestment and the in-migration of relatively well-off middle and upper middle class population. Or in 05, a process involving a change in the population of land users, such that the new users are of a higher socioeconomic status than previous users, together with an associated change in the built environment through a reinvestment 
in fixed capital. That would be houses and infrastructure and parks and schools and the like. Notice that it's both a social change in these definitions toward more affluence and a physical change toward reinvestment in the built environment. And also notice that neither of these even mention displacement because today displacement is thought more of a, of a potential effect or outcome along with many others of gentrification and, and studies show that it's not necessarily inevitable. So, um, oh, I should say one other thing too, which is we also know today that gentrification isn't necessarily always white moving in to black neighborhoods, which is the more common conception of it. Um, that's not unusual in the East where uh, it's made necessary or it's, it's the inevitable result of historic segregation in our cities. But you can have um, higher income blacks or Hispanics um, or otherwise moving in. Um, and so it's not necessarily um, something that's only driven um, by, uh, by, by white people moving in. So what's encouraging it? Think of it as pull into the city, push out of the suburbs. People are moving in because they're attracted to affordable housing near growing job opportunities, or they're attracted in a positive way to the diversity of the population or the amenities or the walkability, getting rid of their cars, the innovation and ideas and, and, and encounters that occur in the city makes businesses want to be there. Families wanting to be near to, their, um, to, to others in the city, uh, proximity to others to get a sense of community that occurs in a more compact, dense, urban environment, um, or the expansion of entrepreneurial culture where young people are moving in to find places to start up new businesses. Meanwhile, there's a push out of the suburbs, uh, commute times, traffic congestion, the cost of commuting, uh, empty nesters no longer needing the space or being as sensitive to the quality or differences of schools, Gen Y culture and households that just don't like the suburbs anymore, standardized architecture and boring visual redundancy in the suburbs, the lack of diverse amenities uh, and, and growing congestion. All of these and many other things are, are, are big forces that are changing in our society that are really increasing the rate of gentrification that we're seeing nationwide since the turn of the century really. Um, so this can have positive effects, can have negative effects. It can help stabilize declining areas, increase property values, um, creating wealth as a result, reduce vacancy rates, increase local financial well being, fiscal revenues, encourage and increase the viability of further development, reduce urban sprawl, increase social mix and diversity, decrease crime, increase the purchasing power at local businesses bringing better services into those communities. This and other things will no doubt will come up in the conversation are possible positives that people have you know, recorded and observed as a result of these changes. But there are secondary or there are negative effects like the most commonly discussed displacements, displacement of lower income persons or, um, uh, or, or, or less expensive businesses as, price and, as prices increase or the secondary psychological cost of displacement when you lose attachment to your community, community resentment and conflict, loss of affordable housing, uh, the displacement of commercial and industrial um, warehouses and other um, businesses, um, increasing cost of local goods and services from um, uh, different kinds of shops coming in. Uh, the bifurcation or segregation or uh, uh, social segregation between the old timers and the newcomers, people that just don't understand each other, they may not be part of the same cultural groups, same churches, uh, same tastes and preferences, same politics, etc. Lack of agency and participation in neighborhood evolution. When you break apart a solid community that had, let's just say, some political power through that cohesion, you break it apart, they lose that. Um, effect on other neighborhoods where the displaced, displaced folks move in or things like the demolition, demolition or histor of historic beloved and sacred places. Um, so those are all positives and negatives. One of the more interesting ones that's not really understood well yet is some observations of the, um, in, of the effect on educational outcomes for school children. We'll talk more about that perhaps we'll have an opportunity. But like I said, gentrification um, and with displacement 
isn't inevitable. I've been doing a study of about, um, of the area in and around downtown, a couple of miles north, a couple of miles south, along um, the, the highways um, of downtown. And about half the, half the neighborhoods um, in that area are experiencing gentrification as defined by the movement in of folks who are making households earning more than 50,000 or $75,000 per year. And, in, 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 and about half of that, of those neighborhoods that are experiencing that have seen displacement and a half and about half have not. So what's uh, the difference? And by displacement, I mean the reduction in the numbers of folks, of households earning less than 35 or $25,000 per year. So half of the neighborhoods that are experiencing it in about 10% of Tucson, where I'm studying, um, have not had displacement, but they've had gentrification and half had not, have not. Well, look on the left, the ones with displacement have experienced a big, a relative, you know, significant decline in household, in housing units, in particular rental units that are renting for less than $800 um, per month. Whereas, um, and then they're getting a increase in the number, the green bar um, uh, on the left, they're getting an increase in the number of units that are about 1,000 to 1,250. Um, meanwhile, the ones that have not experienced displacement are getting an increase in basically all kinds of housing. Um, what that tells you is that a great deal of the displacement is caused by either an increase in the rents um, without um, uh, other affordable units being provided for, or even some of the houses, some of the houses or apartments that were um, more affordable to lower income folks being flipped and sold as um, owner occupied units. Um, but housing development is key to making a difference between gentrification um, um, with and gentrification without displacement. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. So a new vision for gentrification without displacement, or in other words, gentrification with all the positives and with um, fewer or none of the negatives um, would be an interesting thing to explore and see happen. Um, how has that come about? Well, here's just a final slide that gives that vision. Um, it starts with um, an existing economically depressed or underinvested neighborhood with a large minority um, or lower income population. Um, then there is the adoption of a vision by the community um, of gentrification without displacement. Um, in order to do that, you have to identify the cultural uh, and affordability elements, the, the, the shops, the housing, um, the other institutions that are considered to be um, key to preserving the quality of life and affordability in the community for those that already exist there. And, and in various kinds of ways, and we can talk more about them, find a way to protect those against the gentrification changes. Um, then number four, neighborhood in, in installing neighborhood supported affordable housing and retail developments, affordable housing and affordable retail developments for locals and market rate housing and workplaces for urban pioneers. This process of, of people moving in, um, people gentrifying is a very, very powerful process um, that frankly, migration is probably one of the most powerful processes that we have um, on the planet. And so far it's, it's extremely difficult. No one's really found an effective way to stop it from happening short of completely socializing the entire housing market. Um, even um, cities, even countries like China and, and the Soviet Union who tried to control migration have been ineffective at doing that. So providing housing uh, for affordable, for lower income as well as market rate is a critical piece of the conversation. Then you'd get the urban pioneers, young, educated, artistically minded of all races, but it's critical that we then foster positive social interaction between old timers and newcomers through community learning and development activities where the, the old timers, the newcomers get together, learn about each other, discover each other's cultures and traditions um, and um, create a more cohesive community through co community 
learning about one another and development activities, community development activities. Then the neighborhood will acquire, will acquire a positive reputation based on this racial transition and integration and the attention of investors and higher income workers will, will, um, will increase. Um, and those higher income white collar workers um, will then uh, um, move in and help to um, upgrade um, and integrate and improve without having a negative downside effect um, of displacement. Um, and then finally, making sure that we have more guaranteed affordable and workforce housing and retail services um, and the protection of other cultural institutions based on, developed and based on a public inclusive equity-based neighborhood planning process. So uh, those are my remarks regarding what it is, what are the pros and cons, um, why it's happening, how critical the housing piece of this is and how housing determines the difference between um, gentrification with and without displacement um, and how it's um, without a housing strategy um, you end up with displacement with all the negatives and, and fewer of the positives. Um, we really have a choice um, between, um, I would say, um, displacement, gentrification with displacement, or gentrification with affordable housing development, um, um, or the acquisition of the existing affordable housing stock by community land trusts um, or other public entities or private entities that can protect that stock. That's the stark um, choice, policy choice, strategic choice in my mind. Um, and so thank you very much. And I look forward to the other presentations. Thank you, Dr. Paisov. That was very interesting and informative. Now to the audience, I say, remember to submit your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom thing. Our next panelist is Anne Chinetka. Ms. Chinetka is Deputy Director for the City of Tucson Housing and Community Development. She's gonna tell us about the City of Tucson's new Commission on Equitable Housing and Development, and also about City of Tucson initiatives to address involuntary displacement, affordable housing shortage, and other issues related to gentrification. Ms. Chinetka. Thank you, Hershella, and thank you for the league for having me today, and thank you, Dr. Paivo, for setting the stage in such a meaningful way for the rest of us. So, as Hershella mentioned, my name is Ann Chineka. I work for the City of Tucson in the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm going to talk today about where the city is currently at with gentrification and displacement and the initiatives that we have underway. Before I get started jumping into gentrification and displacement, I did want to take a minute to talk about the department and really what the Department of Housing and Community Development does, because it's so related to everything Dr. Paivo just talked about. So um, I'm relatively new to the department, and even I'm surprised by how much the department is working on and how interrelated they are and how it relates to gentrification and displacement. So I'm going to talk about a planning process we're just wrapping up called the People, Communities, and Homes Investment Plan. And that planning process really highlighted to us these three pillars that the department is working on. So in the left here, we're talking about people. And so the city works on supporting, um, supporting individuals and families who are low income and traditionally marginalized communities and really seeing that as integral to the health of the city as a whole. Their communities, we understand that it takes a village. And so it's really this greater social context that really supports those individuals and families. And so really thinking about supporting our neighborhoods, the lifeblood of the city, and then also thinking about supporting our nonprofit organizations and key public facilities such as healthcare clinics, child care facilities, et cetera. And then last but not least, homes and talking about housing really is integral to the department. So we are a pu public housing authority. We have over 15,000 units of public housing. 
We also um, manage the Section 8 voucher program. So we issue over 6,000 vouchers so that individuals and families can have subsidized housing that they can afford. And then last but not least, um, in terms of housing, I wanna say one of the key things that I've been asked to work on for the department is really focusing on what Dr. Pivo said about bringing more affordable housing into the city and trying to make more units available um, for affordable housing. So how does all of that relate to gentrification and displacement? I wanted to start out mentioning that um, about a year and a half ago, I was working for the city manager and mayor and council really had, had been listening to constituents and residents of Tucson and the growing concern over gentrification and displacement. So at that time, the city manager had asked me to put together a team of folks to travel to Austin and San Antonio, really learn from them what they're doing. And I'll say that it was an incredible experience. If anyone's familiar with Austin, there Austin's really not affordable anymore for a huge section of the city. And so really trying to think how we avoid going down that path. And wanted to mention just a few initiatives that we learned about that we will be exploring here. So on the left there, um, this woman, Stephanie Trin, she worked for a council, she works for a council member there in Austin, and she created a policy called Austin Affordability Unlocked. And what that really is, is looking at um, incentives and changing the city code to allow more affordable housing development across the city and really removing barriers to affordable housing. So adding things like allowing density, um, allowing a density bonus, so allowing greater units if you include affordable housing, removing parking requirements, and, and really removing barriers to make affordable housing um, easier. On the top right there, that is a housing development by a neighborhood development corporation. And um, that is a net zero affordable housing site. When we think about the issues of gentrification and displacement, we also have to mention other key city mayor and council priorities, climate change being a huge one. And so how do these initiatives interact? And then on the bottom right there, that's San Antonio's Choice Neighborhood Project. What you're looking at there is actually public housing, not what we traditionally think of when we talk about public housing. And I'm gonna talk about the, I'm gonna end today talking about the city's choice program but it was great to learn about San Antonio's successes. And so um, I'll definitely be interested in hearing the, the results of Dr. Pivo's study on gentrification and displacement. Mayor and council a couple of years ago when the city was amending the infill incentive district, which helps allow for development downtown, they really asked us to look at this. And so we've been doing a housing market study with U of A and Pima County that's a citywide housing market study, recognizing that housing issues are relevant to everyone in the region. On the right there, as part of that study, the first phase was a neighborhood vulnerability index, where we looked at where in Tucson are neighborhoods most vulnerable to shocks, such as um, rising housing costs, natural disasters, or very relevant this year, um, public health issues such as a pandemic. And so we have this vulnerability index that identifies areas that we'll be looking to, to make targeted investments to try to um, support and, and prevent um, some of the harms that, that Dr. Pivo talked about. The housing market study also um, what is a housing data repository. So we have information about where, which neighborhoods are rents increasing, which neighborhoods are housing prices increasing, and really taking a look at this holistically. I mentioned the People, Communities, and Homes Investment Plan. So this is a planning process for the department that's currently wrapping up. We're hoping mayor and council adopt this plan this upcoming week. Um, what it is is a roadmap for the department for the next five years or so, and inviting community partners to help us tackle some of these key issues in Tucson. There on the left, I talk about the inputs that go into the plan and mayor and council priorities being the first one. 
Mayor and council have been very clear that gentrification and displacement are issues that they want us to be working on. And so there in the blue, we talk about the PCHIP priorities and goals. In the community section, we lay out priorities and goals related to gentrification and displacement. And throughout the entire plan, we talk about the traditional structural social injustices that, um, that we know exist and really how can we look at addressing the disparities. The data section I will say is really rich in looking at the disparities in our city. So another key initiative that mayor and council recently launched is um, recreating and creating a new commission on equitable housing and development that really looks at these issues as a whole. And so um, on the left there, you can see the focus areas that the commission will be working on. And on the right, um, there are five key areas that is in the mission that mayor and council and the ordinance that mayor and council established, all of them related but, but the number three one, protect our barrios and communities from rapid change and displacement, as well as structural disinvestment. And so mayor and council have our, have, this commission is now formed. They'll be meeting, the first meeting will be in early February. That information, all meetings are open to the public. And so um, their charge is to really help us develop solutions together we know that the city is not going to address these issues by itself. And so really wanting um, to work on these solutions with the community and work on um, action items with, with the community. And I wanted to end today talking about what, what this looks like in practice. So a lot of the things I talked about before were planning efforts or policy efforts. And what does this look like on the ground? And um, so the city has a choice neighborhoods project. This is a federal grant from the Housing and Urban Development Department to really look at an area of Tucson and on the map there that that area is shown. It's the area around Oracle and Grant Road and it's about two and a half miles. Um, that area today is a really low income area. Some of the um, data regarding that area is pretty staggering in terms of the demographics. And so I'm, I was laughing at Dr. Pivo's new vision because um, I would say that's really what we're looking at for this area is creating a area where we want to bring investment into the area. Um, we want to make sure that people have opportunities that live in that area that today they might not have. Uh, one of the goals of HUD with this is to bring income into the area, but how do we do that without displacing people and really strengthening the neighborhoods and retaining the cultural identity that is there today? It's a really rich area. Old Pasqua is one of the, the neighborhoods there. And people who um, have lived in the area for a long time, it's, it's you know, the traditional Miracle Mile in Tucson. And so this is really um, an effort that we have underway to try to get it right. And, and as Gary said, the, the new vision in terms of bringing wealth to an area while also making sure that the, the residents that are there um, are, are benefited from that. And the picture there with the dancers, so we really are trying to um, have an effort at having the residents plan this um, and really instead of having the boring open houses that people some people love to go to but we're also trying to include more fun active engagement opportunities that really bring residents out in a way that can inform the process moving forward. So I could talk um, at length about that but I know we're, we're short on time today. Um, so those are some of the key things that the city is working on um, and, and really thinking about how to implement mayor and council's vision to address gentrification and displacement. So thank you. And thank you, Ms. Chinitka. Keep those questions coming. Our next panelist is Betty Viegas. Ms. Viegas has extensive housing and community development experience. She served for 17 years as the affordable housing program manager 
for Pima County. She was a recent interim supervisor on the Pima County Board of Supervisors and is the newly appointed executive director of the South Tucson Housing Authority. So Ms. Viegas, housing, how do we do this in the place in, oh, in education? I wish I wish I had that uh, that perfect formula for how we do this uh, without displacing people because for me that is the main um, issue with gentrification is the displacement of people and the displacement of businesses legacy businesses that have been there for a long time so I uh, really appreciate uh, being invited to this panel. And I uh, appreciated the both presentations from Ann Chineka, whom we've had the pleasure of working together um, on some of these issues in the past. Um, this has been going on for a long time. So I thought I would, I would start from the beginning because um, it's important. Tucson's history is important. We all know and love where we live uh, because of its history. And so I thought I would remind people about um, how long we've been here, how long uh, we've occupied this area. And it's one of the longest in, 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 in the nation, uh, 4,000 years of, of, um, of being occupied by our native uh, uh, tribal members, the Tahona Otom Nation. And of course, um, we have our beautiful, uh, which is what I call it as a native. And uh, so this is a, a good picture and a good little summary of Tucson's back, back history. But then we have to go to the next slide, which tells you um, where we really started seeing the impact of displacement here in, in Tucson. And as you know, I, I wanna also add that um, we all know that uh, we were part of Mexico, right? We were here first after our native brothers and sisters. And we uh, migrated back and forth. There was no real boundaries. Uh, and we lived um, in, uh, in the central part of Tucson, what is now the downtown central part of Tucson. Uh, the majority of us. And uh, so we established our roots here along with our African-American um, neighbors and our Chinese neighbors in, in Barrio Viejo uh, primarily. This is where my family was from. And so when we hear about urban renewal, we know that there was a barrio that was destroyed but I wanted to show you this picture because this is a really good um, view of what was there before. And, and the top picture, you can see where it was a thriving, uh, full neighborhood. Um, there were no uh, huge buildings other than to the far uh, east. And, um, and, and so then you see the bottom picture after the destruction and the TCC um, coming in. And you can see that many homes were destroyed. And the, uh, the 60s wasn't that long ago because I remember it. And I remember when my family was displaced. And so there's a personal, um, I, I have a, a personal feeling about this. I have um, a cousin who says, if you drive down Cushing Street and pass El Paso, which is right after El Minuto going west, you'll go right through my living room because that's where we live. That's where my mother was raised. And so it's hurtful. And there's been a lot of mistrust. We're still here. The generations where the stories were told continue. And so the healing has not started. And so I think um, we're on, it seems to be that we're on the right track, but we didn't get there um, easily. And we didn't get there without finally getting people at the city and the administration to listen. 
planning has been an issue here for a long time. And so I'm, I'm encouraged to see the things that are happening at the city. Probably the most that I've ever been in all my life uh, working in, in affordable housing. And so I hope uh, that, uh, that that what they are what they're doing is successful. We we all want that success. So what is happening now? Um, and a lot of this you may have heard uh, from from the others, but um, from my perspective, and and I'm a I'm a person that is on the ground. I have been listening to people for many years about how they're hurting and the affordability issues. So we're seeing, we saw rapid growth in the downtown area, uh, which has, is creating gentrification in the surrounding neighborhoods. We know that the, the downtown, that downtown area has been gentrified. It's, it's pretty much, there's no affordability there or very few. And the few that are there on the, on the outskirts, I would say of, um, of on the south, on the south portion, um, they're quickly being um, purchased by investors and they're being held onto. When you see the, the movement of development going south, you know that it's moving because it's al they've already exhausted the downtown area. The lots that are there, um, in my opinion, should be preserved for long-term affordability. Any new development that comes in should really be looked at where they should, they should really have 20% of whatever they're building be affordable housing and make it a mixed income development in order to, um, to have some sense of affordability for people who work in the areas. So, uh, property values and rents increasing lack of housing affordability. This, this is my issue. This is where I see um, when people are moving in, as Dr. Pillow said, people are moving in uh, because of the affordability, right? Well, that affordability then hurts the people that live there because what they're doing is they're having, they're making the rent increase. So you're, it's, it's a holistic approach that happens but the rents are increase, increasing, the taxes are increasing. And so this is where you get the displacement because regardless of whether people are coming in for the affordability, um, it, they're really creating areas to be unaffordable. And so that's why it's important to keep some sense of, um, of planning and policy in place to make sure that that's not happening. Um, like I said, it's pretty much too late in the downtown area. It's pretty much too late even in the Menlo Park area, which is where I was raised and, and uh, have seen many changes go through there too. But as I see the other surrounding neighborhoods and I'll go through, um, I feel like I'm rushing, but um, you know, we've got, uh, Policy and land use and zoning incentives and dri are driving neighborhoods to change radically. So hopefully the, the, the new changes that are coming will address these issues. Um, uh, one of the big issues also is neighborhoods are changing and losing their historical and cultural identity. So when people move in, not only um, are they bringing their own identity, um, so neighborhoods are transforming culturally as well. And that's something that we've worked on um, with trying to get people in neighborhoods to identify for themselves, what are their cultural assets? What are the places, the people, the, the events um, that happen in their neighborhood that are very important to them? And they should document these things and make sure that it's in their neighborhood plan so that when planning does come in, when, when a developer does come to the city for planning, um, that, that they, they see, these are the things that are important to neighbors. Let's, you know, can you work around these? You know, how can we, uh, how, can, how can we negotiate working with 
you developer and not displacing people and places and and um, and his uh, places of historic historic significance. So though you know I'm I'm giving you what some of the ideas based on what's happening now. Um, other things, and I'm not going to, I'm going to bypass this um, map because this is, I think Anne's was a lot better, uh, but you can see Menlo, the different neighborhoods surrounding um, the, that are, in my opinion, uh, either already gentrified or on the verge of being gentrified. So I'll end with tools and strategies, more tools and strategies, community engagement. I think um, Anne uh, pretty much laid out what they're doing, but I think it's very important um, to make sure that you're listening to all the voices. We know that people that come to neighborhood meetings, people that attend are the ones that with the loud voices and you're listening to them but there's many behind them that you're not listening to. And you have to find ways of engaging those that don't have a voice for whatever reason. Maybe they're not savvy to Zoom right now in these hard times. As things uh, loosen up, make sure that you're going to where they are at. Don't expect people to come to you and your meetings. You need to go to them and have meetings in their neighborhoods and make it easier for people to attend. Um, I was a co-founder of the Community Land Trust uh, Affordable Housing here in, in Pima County, the town Community Land Trust. And this is, an, it, it, this is a great tool for long-term affordabil uh, affordability. I encourage you, I don't wanna go into the details of how a land trust works because I believe that's another forum uh, but go to uh, www.pcclt.org and you'll find what a land trust is, how it works. And um, this is a successful land trust that has um, many benefits to the home buyers and uh, many benefits to the community. Um, and then there's also tenants, giving tenants the opportunity to purchase home ownership and rent and with home ownership and rental counseling. This is important. Um, the tax abatement, reduce or freeze property taxes to protect long time residents. This is something that we know has to happen at the state level, but it's important for us to make sure that our lobbyists at the city, at the county and at, in the, at the neighborhood level are advocating for that at the state level. Um, partners with community-based organizations. These are your nonprofits, nonprofits that know how to do this, nonprofits that used to be in, in affordable housing development before the foreclosure crisis and then had to, had to change their models. But we need to get nonprofits the capacity to start helping us build single family residences again, single family affordable housing. And that's not happening. There's very few besides the, the Pima County uh, Community Land Trust. There's very few that are doing single family residencies right now uh, for home ownership. Um, legacy business districts and incentives. Um, again, you know, it's important to make sure that we have the protections for our historic legacy neighborhood businesses. They have built that their, their businesses on the backs of the people that live there. They offer the services, the food, the, the markets, um, offer the different um, culturally relevant um, items that they use. And so when you're displacing their, uh, their, their customers, then you're, you're going to have to displace them unless you teach them and you you give them the resources and you give them the incentives uh, that you give other businesses that are trying to come into these areas. Many times what you see are businesses that go in and they're copying what's already there and they're making, and then they say it's original, but it's not original. 
And so we have to be really careful uh, to make sure that we are protecting these businesses and that we're giving them the tools. Uh, working with our CRA at the lending level, uh, we need to make sure that the banks are offering investment into our communities more than they are all doing and we have to keep them accountable. And um, I'll go ahead and end with the um, uh, making sure that you know policy and zoning changes occur, especially when it comes to the G plan and the the uh, central business district. You know, when you have a community benefit agreement, that really puts the the job and the duty of getting that um, back to the neighborhoods. And really, that's that's a charge that should come from the planning and the city itself. They should be working with the neighborhoods. I know that recently I uh, was involved in one where uh, one of the councilmen said, well, you know, we can't help you with that. You have to go to the developer and get that benefit agreement. Well, no, you know, there has to be a way for uh, uh, government to be involved in that and be uh, make sure that, that that is a legally binding community benefit agreement something that's gonna have some, some teeth to it, if you will. So I'll go ahead and end with that. I know uh, I've tried to put a lot, uh, a different spin on everything that's been going on, but I wanted to really put out there what really is happening and um, how we can make improvements to it. And there's a lot of work to do. There's people that are working on this uh, from the grassroots level to the new commission that the city has. And I'm very encouraged if we can bring those together to, uh, to have some really um, good, good uh, policy in place. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Villegas, and thank you for all the ideas and everything. Our next panelist, and we're getting more questions, that's good. Our next panelist is Mark Binafe. He's an indigenous Chicano and producing artistic director of Borderlands Theater. From intensive collaboration with the community and he's passionate about creative placemaking, he's produced Southern Arizona narratives in the form of plays, street theater, performances that focus on the heritage of barrios and neighborhoods. Mr. Pinafe. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much to the League for inviting me to be part of this panel and also to my fellow panelists. Uh, it's been a really uh, interesting and engaging uh, conversation so far. Uh, and so I'm glad to, to sort of finish this up uh, with uh, my perspective uh, on gentrification, which comes uh, as, as an artist, as a community artist uh, working at Borderlands Theater. Um, I think, uh, you know, and, and some of the previous presentations have mentioned, right, that uh, aside from the most uh, obvious um, negative impact of gentrification, which is the displacement of, of individuals, uh, those individuals take with them their culture, their traditions, their history. Uh, and I think, you know, just as important as main, making sure that folks who have lived in a place yet to stay there is that their, their heritage stays. Because in the end, um, you know, it is the folk ways of a, of a community, the folk life that makes that community special, that makes it unique. Uh, and as one of the, uh, there was a comment just recently, right? That, that when that goes away, uh, you start, the place starts to look like every other big city, right? The, the, the same uh, Starbucks and I, I mean, I love a Starbucks, but you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, the, the same looking style of biz, of office buildings. And, um, and there's, you know, I think the reason a lot of us are here in Tucson is because of the culture and the heritage uh, of the old Pueblo, right? As, as some folks like to call it. So I'm gonna uh, share um, some, some images and talk to you about uh, a project that we started uh, back in 2015 uh, called the Barrio Stories Project. Uh, we've done two installments of this. Um, uh, one was focused on, on uh, what uh, Ms. Viejas talked about, um, uh, the, the urban renewal in Barrio Viejo, 
that was in 2016. And then the most, our most recent one was in 2018 where we focused on Barrio Anita. Um, and so I'm gonna, let me just share my screen here. All right, so um, we, uh, Barrio Anita, for those of you that don't know, it's located uh, just north of downtown, uh, right? Uh, sort of bordered by St. Mary's, the I-10, Speedway Boulevard and Granada Avenue. Um, this is a picture of uh, some of the residents uh, during after one of the uh, community forums that we did. We, we, we've done many um, meetings and, and activities there. Uh, and basically, uh, going back to about 2017 is when we first started thinking about this project. Um, uh, Barrio Nita, is, is, it was in those maps that we saw where gentrification is taking place. It's certainly experiencing that. And we wanted to find a way, because in the end, a, a lot of this, or all of this, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to develop in the correct way, really involves the participation of the residents, of the longtime residents. And, and is that anybody that's done community organizing knows that it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to get people to, to come out to a meeting. Uh, and, and you know to agree on something uh, it's 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 difficult uh, or challenging you know and as artists you know we are in the business of inspiring folks we're in the business of storytelling um, and we're in the business of creating beauty uh, and so we thought how do we use our skills uh, which are storytelling and, and and inspiring people to inspire people uh, through reminding them, or if they don't know, informing them about the rich culture and history of, of this neighborhood to inspire them to, to, to action, right? And, and there, uh, there was already efforts taking place. Gracie Soto uh, with Anita Street Market uh, was already trying to have community meetings to address the gentrification issues having, uh, they were going on there. Uh, and, and so we were able to sort of come in and through, through artistic and cultural ways, um, try to amplify uh, what was already happening there. And so what are the things that get lost, right? Like uh, I talked about, it's basically, you know, folk life, folk ways, traditions and history. Uh, food is a big one. Uh, there's, uh, very, you know, we all love the food. Uh, that is uh, indigenous to this place. Um, and there's a big tradition uh, with outdoor cooking, uh, you know, mesquite wood grills, um, uh, a, a adobe uh, ovens. This is uh, the, the gentleman with the, that's tending to the fire there, uh, Julian Barcelo, first grade teacher at Davis Elementary, uh, which is there in Barrio Anita. Uh, he's uh, in charge of the one of the two community gardens that are there, uh, and he's really an expert on these heritage cooking techniques. Um, you know, our flour tortillas. A lot of people don't know. Um, there's a there's a heritage grain called Sonora White. It's a it's a wheat uh, that's from this area that is responsible for uh, a more stretchier dough than you have with corn tortillas. Uh, and that stretchier dough allows for large flour tortillas that then, in, you know, the burrito and chimichangas uh, were invented because of, of this, right? Uh, a lot of people don't know that. Um, uh, these are some uh, uh, women and, and, and her children uh, cooking outdoors. Uh, and outdoor cooking uh, over these kinds of stoves, outdoor stoves, were a big, big uh method uh, that everybody used uh, because of the heat, right, that, that's generated in the kitchen. A lot of people cooked outside under Ramada um, uh, to make that work. Uh, gardening, of course, back in the day, uh, everybody in the barrios had a garden uh, or had fruit trees. I mean, everybody. So fresh fruit, fresh vegetables was something that you um, just took for granted, right? You, you had this available to you. Um, this is again another shot of the Davis Community Garden, um, and then there's another garden uh, just in the north part of that neighborhood um, that's also available to community members. Music and culture, uh, we and and all this information I'm giving you was was gained through oral history interviews with with residents, with longtime uh, elders that have lived there uh, 
for generations, their families have lived there. Um, this is a shot of um, uh, Bobby Benton. Uh, may he rest in peace. He's uh, the gentleman in, in the white shirt on the on the right, uh, and he grew up in Barrio Nita, um, and he would he talked a lot, and as many people did, about these uh, fiestas, these these parties uh, that people had in their backyards every weekend, and Bobby. Uh, his uncles and his father would play music. Uh, they would make a, a drink called uh, tesuin, uh, which is like a fruit wine made at home. Uh, and they would have all kinds of food and carne asada and, uh, and they would play music and dance. And this is what folks did, uh, you know, before the internet, <laughs> but when, when you had to come together and to have a good time uh, and certainly a good time was had. Um, and uh, this was at an event that I'll, I'm going to, our Barrio Stories event, uh, where we tried to recreate one of these Barrio Fiestas. Um, there's some folks uh, enjoying some of the, some, some pozole. Um, uh, again, uh, these neighborhoods have a long history. Um, um, Barrio Nita's history goes back uh, at least to the mid 1800s. Uh, but if you, if you, start looking at the uh, native folks that live there than, than you know, even earlier. Um, but people's families, history, uh, you know, their service in World War II, uh, all, all kinds of things. And, um, and these are things that we, we don't want to forget or take for granted. Uh, and so, as I said, how, you know, how do, we, how do we start to recuperate this, this history and this heritage? It's, well, you, you go to the sources, you go to the the people who who remember who were there uh, because of course much of this is, is not written down in history books right this is an alternative history uh, of, of marginalized folks so you have to go to those folks um, this is chino um, Quiros. he worked uh, in uh, at ori uh, you, uh, neighborhood center uh, in the from the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, and we interviewed him and heard a lot of stories about what, what the youth would do and how they would pass their time and uh, what he had to do. Here I am uh, uh, discussing uh, oral history with uh, Sarah Garcia. Uh, her father in the 1930s uh, lost his hands because there was a Cinco de Mayo parade going through Barrio Anita and there were some fireworks that were lit near some children and, and he, he held them in his hands so as not to... Uh, explode on the children and he lost his hands and she's, she's recounting this story to us uh, with uh, a lot of youth there doing activities, cultural activities. Um, anyway, we, we get all these um, histories uh, and then as artists then we turn those histories into all kinds of uh, theatrical and digital media um, uh, artifacts that then we share with the whole neighborhood and, and anybody else really, Tucson in general, to come and learn about what, what happened, what this neighborhood is about. Um, and so that, that's what the actual Barrio Stories, the, the, the culminating heritage festival that happens at the end of these uh, is about. So here uh, we have another resident uh, uh, and we set up these giant screens to, to sh display these oral histories. And so people could learn from, from the residents themselves what, what things were like uh, back in, in, in Barrio Nita's heyday, which uh, uh, was, was quite a time. Uh, it was a time when everybody knew everybody in the neighborhood, when uh, families intermarried uh, and built new houses on plots of you know, their parents um, and, and no one locked doors and everyone looked after each other's kids and um you know there was an and everybody i we spoke to says oh you know and this is their childhood memories you know we were poor but i wouldn't know it i had i had a great childhood i had so much fun and i had so many friends and my cousins and all of these things that that they did um here's uh mr benton again uh, we, we projected these oral histories all over uh, Barrio Anita in different locations. There's a big vacant lot right, right between the Davis School and Ori uh, Community Center. And we set up multiple screens uh, so people could go and, and just sort of listen to the oral histories. 
Some of those oral histories we translated into shadow theater presentations. Um, and so uh, that's what you're seeing here. Uh, this, the fence is the, the fence that's around the basketball courts at Davis Bilingual Elementary. Uh, and the great thing about these projects, right, is that we, we try to uh, uh, incorporate as many residents to help us put them together, and then also reaching out to other, uh, other sectors of the city. Um, these young people that are, are doing all the puppetry, they're students taking a Mexican-American studies class at the U of A. Uh, Professor Michelle Tellez had a class of like 120 students, and all 120 participated in some way. Uh, these 30 of them chose to do shadow puppetry. Um, there is other opportunities for them to, to work on as well. Uh, here we are at, at the Ori uh, Community Center, doing some more shadow puppetry, had a really nice turnout uh, there. Um, and so after this big event that we had um, that really, I'd, I'd say, attracted at least a thousand people uh, a night, um, a couple of weeks later, uh, Barrionita had their first, uh, their elections to reestablish their neighborhood association. Most people know, the, you know, neighborhoods have their neighborhood association and Barrionitas had been uh, inactive uh, for, I don't know, 12, 13 years. Uh, and Gracie was having these community meetings, but it wasn't, and then it certainly wasn't just because we did this event. Um, that there was this interest to re regroup the community again and reestablish the association. And I think uh, what we were able to do really um, motivated folks to come out. And there was about 80 residents that voted to, you know, uh, voted for officers. Um, and pr previous, I had gone to about a year of these uh, meetings, community meetings, there's maybe 10 people. Sometimes there was four people that showed up. And this is it was this huge shift. And I, and I think, you know, again, people get inspired. People are reminded, oh, yeah, this is what I'm fighting for. So that was really incredible. Um, within um, a, a few months, uh, the following summer, um, Ori Pool was reopened. Um, this is, uh, it had been closed for 11 years. So this Gracie uh, in, the, in the black outfit and the white hat uh, who led that charge, a um, bunch of neighborhood kids, our mayor, uh, Mayor Romero, who was at the time uh, Ward 1 councilwoman. Um, uh, again, I think the, it was mentioned earlier, when you have these efforts and it, provi it, it brings publicity, right? We were in the paper, there was a Channel, Channel 12 News uh, uh, covered it, um, and then, you know, then different parts of the city, different uh, residents start to work more actively. And so uh, I, I think it was, I don't know, about almost a million dollars or $900,000 was found to do all the upgrades to the pool that uh, needed to be done to reopen it. It's just a young man having a good time at the new pool, right, where his mom used to go when she was young before they closed it. Um, this was... Uh, uh, free hot dogs uh, that day at the pool. Um, uh, along with uh, the things I mentioned, you know, uh, some new stop signs were put into the neighborhood. Uh, there was a problem with homelessness and drug paraphernalia in the park. Uh, that went down. Um, uh, 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 Tucson Police Department uh, began doing increased uh, ride-throughs there um, and just uh, kind of trying to keep things in check a little more. Um, some more residents there, long time. These, these folks, their families have lived there for many generations. Uh, and this is the, the final shot. This is just a, another place that we, we projected um, some of the oral histories and a lot of archival footage uh, of, of the past. Um, so that's my presentation. Thank you, Martin Afe. Thank you, Mr. Pineta, very much. And now it's time for Q&A. We have some good questions here. I'm going to start with the very first one. Um, it's for Dr. Pivo, Pivo, Dr. Pivo, sorry. 
Where can we find the study presented that you presented? Well, I'm in the middle of doing it and it should be done in March. Um, I'm actually doing it for the city. Uh, and so it'll be a public document. And so it should be available around then. And um, so stay tuned. I'll make sure I share it with the league as well so that um, if there's some sort of, sort of follow-up. But you can also take down my information and just contact me around March and I'll send it to you. Okay, and your information, well, we can get that out to people. Okay. Uh, or you can let- Or just use that, write that name down and Google it. Um, at the University of Arizona, you'll find, just Google it. You'll okay, find just it. Google your name Yeah, yeah. at the U of A. Okay, yeah. thank you. And this one is for Ms. Chinetka, P-CHIP. What does that stand for, P-CHIP? Yeah, I, I put that in the, the answer. So it's People, oh. Communities, and Homes Investment Plan. Okay. So um, thinking about the three pillars, people, community, and homes, and, and really how we invest for the future in those really important areas. Okay. Um, there was a, a comment with a question. I've heard that the area near Mercado San Augustine has been gentrified. Would the area and the new developments and all around there qualify for the definition of gentrification or how would you describe it? You know, I'm, I'm gonna jump in, but I'm actually really curious to hear from Betty too, who mentioned, um, so that uh, the Mercado San Augustine is in Menlo Park and she mentioned she grew up there. Um, so I do have some comments about this area because it's something I've been looking at a lot lately, but I'd love to hear from Betty first. Okay. Ms. Villegas? Right, it's, it, the direct area is, is all new development and it's totally unaffordable to any working class unless um, you have subsidized housing, which is the, um, there's the senior center closer to the river and then there's an affordable housing um, complex right um, on Congress. But those are filled, you know, there's, there's never a wait, there's, there's always a waiting list and never many vacancies in subsidized housing. But other than that, um, that area is gentrified. Now there's a pocket um, of, uh, which is called Barrio Sin Nombre, which is right in back of that area. Um, where a lot of uh, disinvestment has happened over many years, which is what happens with gentrification, a neighborhood, that little pocket there, um, as they were building all this new development, very little investment went in there. You know, they had been asking for many things for many years and um, very little went in there and uh, as soon as that new development was done, then now we're seeing investment go in there because now it's worth it, right? Because the values have gone up tremendously. People that live there are being hounded daily for them to sell their homes, their properties. Um, and, um, and, and many, I have a friend there who, who only pays property taxes and has exemptions but because the values are so high, he still can't afford his taxes. And so he's in jeopardy of losing his home. Um, and he's on a fixed social security income. So this is a person that is very close to displacement in that area. So um, it's, it's, there's opportunity for the city to do things there, in my opinion, uh, but uh, they have to move quick or the, the, the market will take over. And, and so thank, thank you, Betty, given that you grew up there, I wanted to, to hear your thoughts. Um, I'll say this area is interesting to me for many reasons. One is the Neighborhood Association actually has a subcommittee focused on gentrification and affordability. So the neighborhood itself is recognizing this is a real issue and, and is really thinking about how to proactively address the issue and I have a, there's a city owned land, um, there's a city owned property in that neighborhood that we're working on trying to get an affordable housing project on. 
which made me dig a little bit deeper into the area. And based on that housing market study, one thing that I found fascinating, the, as you mentioned, the home prices are, are certainly going up. Um, the data itself shows rent prices are going down. And I do not think, and, and, and let me clarify why I think that's the case. You had mentioned those two subsidized housing projects. That's over 200 units of subsidized affordable housing that has been brought in during the time in which it shows rents going down. And I think that's, that's really showing that um, thanks to those affordable housing projects, it's, it's showing an impact. And yet that doesn't mean if you're there and your rents are going up that it's any more affordable. So really looking at that, you mentioned the, the money going into Barrio San Ombre. That was actually thanks to mayor and council when um, Caterpillar and some of the Mercado got approved. They set aside over, it's about $1.2 million to improve Barrio San Nombre. So that's an example of where wind development's happening, how the city can piggyback off that and make sure residents in the area benefit from that. Can I just say though that um, public infrastructure investment um, of you know improving streets and sewers and gutters putting in parks, doing green complete streets, all of those things can increase gentrification. Um, and um, so if they're not combined with um, housing strategies, um, they can make the problem worse, not better. It's sort of like Betty's comments were implying. Um, and um, same with police uh, enforcement, you know, crime goes down, rich people are more attracted. So you have to think holistically as everybody's been saying. I'd also like to just emphasize that there's no such thing as a lost cause, as far as I'm concerned. Betty, you know, you said um, Menlo Park and downtown, that's gentrified. It's, you sort of implied it was a lost cause. But if we can restore um, the water in the, in the Santa Cruz, then we can restore the cultures and the affordability and uh, the opportunity for people of all incomes and ethnicities and backgrounds in these neighborhoods. I'm absolutely confident in that. It's a matter of deciding we wanna do it. Um, so displacement can be reversed is really what I'm saying. Although those who experience displacement experience that cost, it's hard to um, necessarily bring them back and mitigate that directly after the fact, but it, you can restore this. And I think we should think in terms of that, given that some of these barrios are so incredibly important to the fundamental value and culture of this, uh, of our community, you know, it's, I'd hate to see them, um, you know, basically all owned and occupied by, you know, Hollywood stars um, or whatever is going on. And the other thing I wanna say is that the downtown development is more the solution than the cause. Um, most every, if you talk about downtown development in terms of employment growth, you know, office buildings and jobs and all that, um, hardly any of those people, I'm talking over the last 10 years, all of that growth, only dozens of those empo new employees live in and around the downtown area. If you look at commuting data, they live all over the region um, from the foothills and, you know, everywhere. Um, and so that's not what's, that doesn't, that's not what's driving up things, although they're immediate pockets like you were just describing, um, where uh, Caterpillar no doubt a few of those Caterpillar employees are gonna be looking in those neighborhoods. But again, most of them won't be. Um, and um, uh, so at least from a jobs driving and gentrification point of view, that's not a problem. That's what my data is showing. Um, and so what happens with that growth and development is it creates revenue that can be used to support the affordable housing and all the other kinds of things we really need. So in a way it's part of the solution not so much a part of the problem. It is also true that all the cultural development downtown, that's attracting all these people who want to gentrify because they want to be close to the cool, hip, groovy downtown. But, but most of them don't, again, work downtown um, exactly where they work or maybe they're just all retired. Um, we have to look into that a little more closely. But the, but the growth of the culture, cultural institutions and, and entertainment and all the rest downtown does bring with it um, more um, of a press, a push for gentrification than the job growth. And so with that and all the tax revenues and everything else it brings, we need to think in terms of linking those developments also to strategies for addressing gentrification. So we can restore and downtown growth isn't really the problem. Everybody, it's, but gentrification is occurring. It's really downtown growth can be part of the solution. 
Okay, and speaking of Hollywood stars, <laughs> actress Diane Keaton bought a house in one of the downtown barrios. How did that affect the, or do you think it would affect the property values of the neighbors and what happens with their taxes and how, how does all of that fit? Well, any, we know <laughs> real estate, I'll just quickly say, we know from real estate studies that um, there is an immediate neighborhood effect from um, housing prices going up in any particular lot or block, you know. So yeah, there's going to be a, a modest spillover effect from that, but it'll it dissipates a block or two or three away unless it's of such status as in somebody like Diane Keaton that it really gives the entire neighborhood a sense of panache that that where my mother-in-law would want to move down there, you know, and she does so. Uh, no doubt it does uh, it's hard to prove it but no but uh, but it's i'm sure it does if you could it's hard to measure it is what i'm saying but i'm absolutely confident uh, it does but that but again you can't it's really hard to, to to find a way to stop that from happening um and prevent people from making those investments and reinvestments and 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 a lot of those folks dearly would appreciate having diverse mixed culturally Protect, preserved um, uh, traditions and cultures going on around them. So they can be, they can bring their clout, their money, their, you know, their influence to helping preserve what's around there. Um, as long as it's not just kind of, you know, whitewashing, um, but it's serious. And, and I don't doubt that somebody, a lot of these folks really do care a great deal about, you know, social justice in our society. So we should get them involved. That's good. That's the only thing, thing I'll thing. have if I can just add to the Keaton house, which I have a problem calling it the the Keaton house because you know that's not what it was. You know, it it, it seems that now that house was made famous because of her. It's almost the same thing as the the Sosa Carrillo house, right? It was made famous because the governor um, lived there supposedly, which he never did. Fremont. But it wasn't made famous because Sosa and Carrillo lived there. It was made famous because supposedly a white governor lived there. And that's the only reason it was saved. So, you know, these are, these are some of the implicit uh, biases that, that continue to happen in our community. And, um, and uh, you know, so we have to, you know, what, I guess I have one, one area where, where I really have an issue with is recently I saw an ad um, where we are the city, not me, but this, the, the visitors bureau, the uh, young um, professionals or somebody had an ad where they were actually um, soliciting people from other states to come and live here to telework and they were giving incentives for that. And it's an economic development tool, I guess. But, you know, my first thought was if you're giving incentives for people to come here to raise our rents, why aren't you giving incentives for people to stay here and learn how to telework from their own home? And so, you know, sometimes we get things wrong and we have to figure out a way to fix them. You know, so that's what I'll say. Thank you. And that sort of follows along with another question that we have. What policies and programs are there to assist people with maintaining their homes so that they can stay in them? And I know you talked about subsidized housing, but what other policies or programs are out there to assist with that? Um, I'll say from the city's end, we do have programs to help um, homeowners, low-income homeowners in maintaining their houses. We also have a program to help folks who are in mobile homes um, rehabilitate their mobile home. And so um, they exist. I think that one of my goals is to do a better job advertising those programs so that more people take advantage of them. And then, of course, um, like many things, um, we don't have enough money to cover the, the need across the city. So really looking at how to grow that pot of money, but absolutely agree that rehabilitation is, is a big piece, especially knowing the age of our houses and that that's going to be a, a growing issue moving forward. 
And um, thank you. And another question: <clears throat> What focus is being put on public green spaces? And I think Mr. Benate talked a little bit about some of the new good things that would have that have been happening in the community. But and also Dr. Paivo talked about what happens with green spaces. But the most recent debate involving the zoo makes people stop and think about public green spaces. That people want public green spaces. So is that something that's being considered in all the development and things? And I'm just throwing that out there. I see Anne shaking her head yes. <laughs> so yeah. I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, a couple of things on that. <clears throat> Betty and others mentioned community benefit agreements in, in the um, economic development tool, the GPLET tool has been mentioned a few different times. And I'll say um, one of the thing that's one of the things that's considered is when the city improves incentives for development, how can we get better? Um, how can we make sure that those developments support the, the local community and something like green space is one mm -hmm. of the things that we're looking at trying to encourage developers to include as part of their development, which would help them in getting incentives. So that's one example. Okay. I would put gentrification in response to displacement and all that we've been talking about into the larger context of economic opportunity and social development for um, underprivileged, um, lower income um, neighborhoods and families. And, um, and what we've been talking about in terms of um, taking advantage of the positives from gentrification, the new money and investment that comes in and creating jobs and opportunities um, and, and, um, in, and reinvestment, this can all be very positive toward that end. Um, but it's not just about money, it's also about creating um, places and spaces in these neighborhoods um, that are um, um, improving the quality of life for folks of all incomes and, and backgrounds. And so green spaces can be a critical part of that. And I agree completely that the city's rules with respect to providing open spaces connect in connection with new developments it, it should be, it should require that some of that be external to the building, not a lot of these apartment buildings, it's inside or up on a deck or whatever, you know, and that's um, not really in the spirit of what we're talking about. But that said, and, and, and the city should be spent, of course, the city has, a, I think, a pretty positive reputation historically about, you know, uh, putting in parks and taking care of parks um, for all um, neighborhoods throughout the city that should continue. Um, but um, there is a big debate nationally about whether um, um, green infrastructure, as it's called these days in some respects, um, it causes gentrification. And people have been looking, about, looking at that, and there's a lot of politics around that in the Northeast, for example. People have been looking at that, and the, the bottom line is if you do a major green investment, um, kind of like we did um, before, behind the, the Father Kino um, statue, where all of that uh, green, all that green was put in for um, for uh, flood control and other sorts of things. That kind of a massive investment can actually increase property values for sure and and stimulate some gentrification problems like we're talking about. Um, but smaller um, pockets, pocket parks, and so forth, rather than large scale um, trails and so on, um, um, can be can be a, a much better fit in that regard. At the same time, giving people access to the loop to be able to commute um, as you know, the, the loop does go through lower income neighborhoods from the south and giving them an opportunity to use it as a commuting opportunity for exercise and so forth is, is very valuable. So it's a, it's, a, it's a complex subject, green infrastructure and green space. Um, it's very, very important, but we have to be careful and thoughtful about these implications for gentrification. Okay, and I know that Ms. Viegas said community land trust would be a whole new program to really get into it. But can you, can someone just briefly define community land trust? What are they and how do they work? And just a very brief description without getting into the weeds, as they say, but without getting into too much detail. 
<laughs> okay, I'll try. Uh, so a community land trust is a it, it's um, it's a way of of uh, providing affordable home ownership to lower income working class people, people that are at the eighty percent of median income, whatever it would be, um, and below. And what it does is it takes it it's, uh, takes the land out of the equation of the home. So a person would come in and buy the home, but the land would stay in a ground lease for 99 years, plus it can be renewed for an additional 99 years. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it's inheritable. Um, so you don't really lose that, but um, I'm just gonna use a quick example. $130,000 home, I don't think there are any more, but if there was a $130,000 home, um, somebody could come in and we take the $30,000 right off the top. And then we'd also write down an additional 20% so that they don't have to pay any mortgage insurance to the lender. So they would only have to qualify for a loan for $80,000 on a $130,000 home. They would have all the benefits of home ownership. And it, like I said, it's inheritable and it would stay affordable. So, so basically they're getting um, a subsidy up front. And at the same time, there, we're also creating economic opportunity because they're going to have more disposable income to contribute to our economy. And when they're ready to sell, and we've had people sell, um, they do get a portion of the equity, not the entire thing. They get 25% of whatever they have put in plus the value on uh, what it's sold for. And the 75% stays with the house so that we can then restore it and resell it to another affordable homeowner. So it's, a, it's, it's an investment that keeps on giving and it doesn't take a lot of subsidy except in, initially it does, but then we don't need any more. So okay. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but in and Yes, a I know you said it would take a whole program. This is all the time we have. I'm going to close it out. And I apologize if we didn't get to somebody's question, but we covered as much as we possibly could. I want to thank the panelists, Dr. Gary Pivo, and Janetka, Betty Villegas, and Mark Binate. You've been excellent. Thank you to the DEI Program Planning Committee, Chair Judy Wood, Co-Chair Mary Grisham, Marty Cortez, John Heeman, April Lewis, Nancy Norton, Sadie Shaw, Tracy Peterson, Pat Markey, and Debbie, Debbie Wallace. It did take a team to put all of this together. A special thank you for the technical support from Adrian Barton and Jeremy Brittle. Without them, we could not do this. And thank you to the audience for your participation. But we're asking something of the audience and of everyone here. We're certainly more informed than we were at the beginning of this program, but we're just beginning. Attend more meetings, ask questions, contact city council, board of supervisor, let your voices be heard, let your concerns be heard. This program and a list of resource materials will be posted on the Tucson League of Women Voters Greater Tucson website in about a week. And that website is lwvtucson.org. Thanks to everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Stay involved. Thank you.